Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Our guest today is Dr. Vincent Figueredo, author of The Curious History of the Heart, A Cultural and Scientific Journey, published by Columbia University earlier this year. Dr. Figueredo has been a practicing cardiologist and scientist for almost 30 years. As you'll see, his study of the heart exceeds its physical and mechanical bounds, although that's what he's been doing a good portion of his life, and embraces the romantic, the cultural, the spiritual aspects of this muscle, this fist-sized muscle, this pump, this electrical engine, which is why we're here today and able to have this talk. It's anatomy, it's health, it's disease, it's death are all part of this book. But what is exciting and unexpected is the other heart that the doctor shows us. It's the heart of the ancients who felt it was a heart that ran things and the brain was just like a, a useless glob of mucus that you could pull out through the nose if you're Egyptian. Um, the heart that loves, the heart that breaks, the heart that gives, the heart that leads, the heart of gold, the heart that made Richard lion So what is this organ drives the blood throughout our body that nourishes us, that literally feeds us and gives us the very air that we breathe? So let's ask Vincent. Hello, doctor. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, uh, we talked a little bit before we began about the title because, as I said, I'm a bookseller. And um, although it's a cliche, the people who come into my store generally judge books by their cover. And the title is the most important aspect of that. So um, why is the heart and this particular history of it a curious thing? When people sometimes think of curious, oh, well, that's interesting. Or curious might be, oh, this is something evanescent or spiritual or extraordinary in some sense. Are both of those meanings implied in the title? I would say all of the above. Um, I, I'm a physician scientist. I have been for most of my life, and I'm curious by nature. Um, very early in my career, I became fat, fascinated by this remarkable organ, the heart. And I like to read books that uh, focus on the history of a single subject, like Salt to World History or um, Emperor of All Maladies about cancer. So I decided early on in my career, I was going to eventually write a book on the history of the heart. And I spent 20 years gathering data, started writing it five years ago. And what I found was throughout human history, there's this continuity of curiosity that carries from prehistoric times to present. The heart for our ancient ancestors was the king of the organs. It was the, the home of emotions, of memory, of reasoning. It was where the soul was in our body and it's how we connected with God. And that held true for millennia, multiple millennia. And then around the time of the Renaissance, the heart became demystified as just a blood pump. Curiously, at the same time, the heart began to um, be used more and more in art and literature and daily uh, society as a symbol of romantic love as a symbol of love of family and of God. And it began to appear on coats of arms of families and the shields of crusaders. Uh, and so it was curious that while the heart seemed to drop in importance physically or scientifically, it became more important symbolically uh, to humans in societies around the world. The purpose of the title was I wanted people to know there was more, more than one history of the heart. There was the, the, the history about the exploration and experimentation that helped us learn how the heart worked and how we can treat it. But there was also this curious obsession by society with the heart and the heart symbol as to what it meant with regards to our love and our relationships to each other. You know, it's funny, and I'm jumping to the very end, but I thought about something about you when I read in the acknowledgments, because 
it was very heartfelt in the acknowledgement that you thank your patient. Yes. And I thought, what a nice guy. And so it was like heart to heart. You get these cliches in Shakespearean. They go on, they go on forever. So, okay, well, then why did you feel this heartfelt gratitude towards your patients? Um, I have been in many things over my career. Um, I've been a chair of cardiology, a professor of medicine. I've been a scientist in the laboratory. But the one thing I've always been is a physician to my patients. Um, my favorite thing in, in the world is, is caring for hearts. And my patients um, allow me that privilege. And so they are important to me. And, and you're emotional about it as you say it. Yeah. And that goes to the brain heart connection. But I, I jump all around, so let's hold off on that. Um, but I think one of the most fascinating, you know, and as I said, when I began the book, I didn't expect, you know, I expect, okay, anatomical history of the heart. It's going to show you how the heart works, how it pumps, um, artificial hearts, heart transplants, things like that. But you start off in the ancient path. And of course, all of us know that. In fact, let's, let's talk about pulling the heart, pulling the brain out through the nose. This hook, by the right? I never under, I never figured out how they could actually do it. I, I don't, I don't like to think about it. But um, for many ancient societies, um, like Egypt, uh, the heart was considered uh, where oneself was. It's where emotions, reasoning, and memory were. So it was treated with great reverence. So, for instance, when the Egyptians would embalm a body they would remove all the organs from the body except the heart they would put back in. The other organs were put in pots next to the body. The brain was considered just a phlegm producing organ of no importance. And so they literally would try and pull it out and rinse it out to clean out the cavity. And so if when you first began thinking about this decades ago, while you were working every day with the muscle holding it in your hands, did you ever just come up with a supposition as to why people assumed or presumed or thought why right here is mm -hmm. So if you think about our ancient ancestors, for them, you know, the beating of a heart meant life. And that heart would beat faster with fear and with love. And when someone died, the heart would stop beating and the body would cool. So it made sense to them that the heart determined life. And it was actually, it was a furnace. It's what kept the body warm. And when the heart stopped beating, the body would cool. So when they would experience emotions, fear or love, that heart would beat faster and stronger. So they associated emotions with the heart. And as they tried to figure out where was their, their self, their ability to connect with God, put their hands right here. Where do you point to when you say me? Right here. So that it was no surprise that at that time they would think that the heart was the king of the organs and, and the home of the soul. And then as you go through the book, you begin to see how that attitude changed. But tell us also, I meant to say, the illustrations and graphs in the books are really instructive and they're very accessible for the reader. So I want to say that since I have the proof and can't really show them right now. But um, given that, what was the metamorphosis of that ancient feeling of the heart as a center? How did it gradually? including through the dark ages, morph into this idea that, no, I think we're wrong about that aspect of how we work. So while most ancient societies, whether we're talking Sumerians, Egyptians, Chinese, Indian, early Greeks, um, they all thought they were cardiocentric. They believed the heart was, was the repository of emotions, memory, and soul reasoning. Um, there were some early Greeks that began to question that. Uh, they, they noticed that when someone got hit in the head and they were knocked out, they were unconscious. So maybe the brain did have some importance. But certain um, 
thinkers back in that time, Aristotle and of, you know, of Greece and Galen, who was Greek, but of Rome, um, they, their thoughts predominated and they were cardiocentric. And when the Middle Ages started and the Catholic Church sort of subjug subjugated all forms of thinking, they said that Aristotle and Galen are correct and everything else is wrong. And that held true in, in medieval Europe right up until the Renaissance when the likes of uh, da Vinci and Vesalius and William Harvey came around. And so you talk a lot about the church in the book. And obviously during that time period, the church and science were often at odds, whether you're talking about LA or anybody who challenged right. the ancient, the, the Greeks. So how did that, I guess when I read a book, I always wonder about, especially a book like this, or a Salt, which I read, or Upper of Maladies, which I also read. I always wonder about what's the tipping point, just like Malcolm Gladwell's class. So right. Yes. If if there is a swerve, which is another book, a good book, if there is a tipping point or a swerve, when was it? If you could, I mean, it's, it's a fuzzy. It was, it was as we came out of the of the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance. Um, probably the first person who we can really acknowledge as understanding the workings of a heart as a as a pump would be Da Vinci, but unfortunately, his works. Uh, were kind of hidden for 250 years after his death before we really saw those. Um, Vesalius, uh, who was probably one of the greatest grave robbers of history um, so that he could dissect, 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 um, he started producing some very accurate anatomical uh, of illustrations of the heart and an understanding of the heart. But it was, I'm going to say, when William Harvey experimentally demonstrated that the heart was the center of a circulatory system and it was essentially a blood pump. Uh, that's when the heart began to be demystified and viewed as just another organ, its purpose pumping blood. And that brings me to uh, like a segue into the anatomical. You know, when you're in middle school or like me in junior high school, and the, the things you always learn, are the, the ones you remember, it's the size of a man's fist. Um, that's the first thing. And then right. the next thing are four chambers. And then depending on who your teacher is, you know, you're basically talking about plumbing or an electrical system or right. some other aspect of the house. Mm -hmm. And so why don't we do that? Why don't we go through what's inside this mechanism and what it does for us? So um, as Harvey demonstrated and um, Da Vinci understood, the heart is a, is a blood pump um, and it's a remarkably efficient one. It pumps uh, a gallon and a half per minute. Um, it pumps uh, over 2000 gallons a day and it pumps over 58 million gall gallons over a lifetime. If you turn a faucet, kitchen faucet on full force, that's more than 50 years of that faucet being on. That's the amount of blood that that little heart that's a little bigger than the fist uh, pumps. Heart's probably about half to two thirds of a pound um, and it's beating 70 to 80 times uh, per minute. And it does that throughout life. Um, I think, what did I have? Like 30 billion times. And uh, it never fails. It never fails. It's pushing about a third of a cup of blood per beat out. But by doing that, it ends up being a gallon and a half uh, per minute. And that's about how much blood is in our body. So it's circulating the blood in our body every minute. If you had to tick things off, if an alien was, an examining, was examining a human body for the first time, how would you be able to determine, at first blush, you wouldn't, that it's not only plumbing, but it's electrical. It's providing us with, in a scent, nutrients, and also allowing the lungs to restore oxygen to the very fluid. Right, so um, what Harvey uh, eventually understood was the heart 
is actually two circulatory systems. And there's a pulmonary circulatory system and a systemic to the body uh, circulatory system. And uh, the electrical system that allows that heart to beat every 70 to 80 beats per minute um, is, is remarkable. It, it's, a, it's essentially a biologic pacemaker that functions in the majority of us without fail for our entire lifetime. When you, when you think of Harvey, as you've been talking about him, doesn't it feel like you're actually standing on the shoulders of giants, like they say about Newton? Yes. He did a pretty damn good yeah. job. Many people will say that Harvey did not discover circulation. And in fact, you can even look back to uh, ancient ancestors like uh, the Indians and the Chinese, and they probably had a sense that blood left the heart and came back. They just couldn't prove it. Where you give Harvey credit is that he experimentally demonstrated it and definitively proved it. And that's kind of when the heart started becoming just a pump. So funny, when my brother and I were little, we always we were so fascinated with the idea that blood inside the body was blue. And we would actually cut ourselves sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk yeah, about that, that's just light diffraction. <laughs> it's actually it's actually sort of a maroon when it's uh, deoxygenated and bright red when it's oxygenated. It's funny. I was listening to um, the, a YouTube video that you did with the Einstein Hospital Network about sure. heart. And what was interesting and, and what made me think of it is we're talking about, you know, this obviously lasts our whole lives and a healthy heart does a great job, but just as we're doing with our environment, as we're doing with civil discourse in today's society, a lot of us, maybe the majority of us, really mess up the heart's doing its job. And you ticked off a lot of those things in that few minutes that you spoke to that woman about, and it must be depressing to you at times, you know, here's this wonderful muscle that was doing just great. And then you started eating badly. You started sitting all the time, smoking all the time. Yeah. Yeah, um, it, it's a shame because heart disease incidents would really uh, decrease if we walked more, we ate a little less, we didn't smoke. Um, but in modern Western societies, I mean, we're, we do it because we're able to, we can afford it. Um, those are things that I have conversations with my patients and I, and I'm, I'm blunt with them and honest and I, they appreciate it, but there's other factors that are, that are also affecting the heart that sometimes I don't think is fair to blame on them. And that's stress and anxiety. Uh, and those are, those are major players in heart disease. And, uh, until recently we really did not count them as risk factors. And we really didn't think it was important to deal with those things. But, but stress, anxiety, depression are major players in heart disease. Well, there you go. That gives us a nice segue into the brain-heart connection because yes. I'm thinking, why is he saying that? Okay, the stress I have resides in my brain. The anxiety I have, regret, worry, all that is in the brain. But even as I'm talking about it, I kind of feel it here. But why is that? It's like the stomach being the second brain. Right. What's going on there? So after Harvey demystified the heart as a pump, the heart's remained a pump until very recently. And it was assumed that the brain unilaterally sent orders to the heart and the heart responded. But what we're now finding is there's this dynamic two-way dialogue between the heart and the brain. And it turns out that the heart's sending as many signals to the brain as the brain is to the heart. Uh, in fact, in examining the heart, there is an area in the top of the heart where there's almost a little brain. There's over 40,000 nerve cells attached to the heart and it helps the heart sense, regulate and remember. An example of how the heart can negatively affect the brain are uh, is anxiety or panic attacks. And it's often the case that these people have unrecognized abnormal heart rhythms. So that normal rhythmic electromagnetic, en electromagnetic energy that goes up to the brain from the heart, because the heart's a very powerful electromagnetic generator, that irregularity affects the brain 
And the heart can affect the brain and the medulla, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, which is the emotion center. And that abnormal rhythm causes these people to have panic attacks and anxiety. And when it's discovered that they have the abnormal rhythms and they're fixed, their symptoms go away. Examples of where the, the heart beneficially affects the brain are uh, co coherence methods like meditation or mindfulness, um, singing in a choir, feelings of uh, compassion. All of those generate very stable rhythmic rhythms that feed the, the brain and lead to increased motivation and pain tolerance and, and improved emotional connectivity. Would you actually say that the neural network that's our brain is actually connected to another neural network? As far as the heart, the little brain in the heart? Yeah. Well, it, whether the two are directly related, most of the signals coming from the heart go through the vagal nerve back up to the brain. Um, what that group of neurons is probably doing in the heart is helping the heart itself to sense, to regulate, to remember. So but then, the, go ahead. And, and by the way, the heart connects with the brain, not only nerve-wise, but hormone-wise, and as I said, electromagnetically. It turns out the heart produces as much oxytocin, the love hormone, as the brain does. Well, one of the things you talk about, I have to write notes now, I'll forget. <laughs> Because I'm going to be 71 next week. My nephews for my 70th birthday gave me a really good Philips uh, 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 defibrillator. Oh, nice. The best present I ever got, right? <laughs> Could come in handy. No, <laughs> I just have to be there. You know, it's, it's like the survivalists who build these shelters. But I always say to them, you need to be there when it happens. <laughs> Otherwise, it's kind right. of... And you, have, have, you can't exactly use it on yourself, so... Now, if someone asked me if you could, and I said, nah. I don't think so. It says, but it talks to you. I said, yes. <laughs> but at that point, you really can't. You're usually not conscious, so. But, <laughs> sorry. But when, when, the, when you're talking about fight or flight, I was thinking because you were talking about anxiety. So this is a crude way of putting it. Is, so when you, when you go into that fight or flight and adrenaline is flowing, if it's... it's if it's not real, if you're paranoid, if you're schizophrenic and you, and you, you see a danger that isn't there, but that, that response is what happens. Are you essentially wasting heartbeats? Well, figuratively, yes, um, because obviously that's going to produce stress and anxiety. And stress and anxiety directly have negative implications with regards to cardiovascular disease but they also lead to bad behaviors. So those people, you know, they're, they're not physically active. They smoke more, they drink more. Um, and that stress is just constantly producing, you know, the, the, it's activating the sympathetic nervous system and it's increasing cortisol levels. And those all have negative effects on the cardiovascular system long-term. So yeah, your wasting heartbeats is figuratively correct. I was just thinking about when you were talking about America, you know, you go to a restaurant and you get a bowl of spaghetti that's way more, you, you are not hungry one third of the way through the meal, yet you eat the entire meal because as you said, you can. So I was wondering, in your career, you know, you've written over 200 papers, you've attended conferences all over the world. Have you ever studied different societies and why they are healthier, why they live longer? Well, the easy answer to that is, is, is look at, developing nations. So, I mean, you know, westernized nations, the US, Europe, you know, much higher rates of cardiovascular heart disease than countries that are third world. Um, and then you look at the third world countries that are now starting to develop and they're adopting Western culture. So they're adopting the lifestyle and, uh, and, uh, and the, the envir environmental ramifications of, of a developing nation. And as they do that, the uh, rate of heart disease and stroke goes up. That's the other thing that you mentioned in that talk on YouTube um, with Einstein um, was people shouldn't forget that this is essentially the number one killer. 
It has been the number one killer since 1900, with the exception of two years because of the Spanish flu. Wow. And it is the number one killer. Well, let me ask you this. Is it fair to call it the number one killer because sometimes the death isn't actually caused simply by the cessation of a beating heart? Right. Pick off those things that, that make that happen. Um, if, when we talk about cardiovascular disease, so that includes um, heart disease, stroke, peripheral arterial disease, um, cardiovascular disease is far and away the number one killer worldwide of adults. Um, but even heart disease itself is pretty much the number one killer in developing nations or developed nations. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, 10 times as many women die of heart disease than they do of breast cancer. And yet we do a pretty miserable job of discussing with women the importance of risk factor modification to prevent heart disease. But we are very focused on breast cancer. So, yeah, it's funny how things get a certain buzz about them. Yeah. People don't take the long look. It's forest and trees kind of thing. One of the poignant things that you mentioned, because we were just talking about how the heart does such a great job, is the situation when you talk about young athletes. Yes. Dying. And, you know, they have exactly the lifestyle that you recommend in your talk. Right. So, unfortunately, about one in 50,000 young athletes per year suddenly die. That comes out to about 75, 13 to 25 year olds in the United States per year. And the reason for this is they have underlying genetic heart issues that weren't recognized. One is called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with too thick of a heart muscle wall. Others have abnormal takeoff of the coronary arteries that feed the heart muscle that take sharp turns and can suddenly occlude. Others have problems with their electrical system and can develop dangerous heart rhythms uh, with exertion or immediately after. And they look perfectly healthy. So um, unless you screen for it, you're going to miss it. Um, and there are many programs, one that I've worked with, Simon's Heart, that is trying to educate um, uh, parents and schools about athletes and the potential for sudden cardiac death. Uh, and they go in and, and, and uh, do screenings. Yeah, the other thing is, well, I was, uh, there was a great guy on our softball team. Must have been, he was like 23 years old. He was playing in center field and he just fell down. Yeah. In our township, it takes 20 minutes for the ambulance to get there and no one else knew what to do. Whereas, and I can't remember his name, the football player this year. Yes. Yeah, DeMar Hamlin. So, right. And they, they, were, they were there within minutes or seconds with the defibrillator. And to, and to save these people, you have to be there within seconds because that they're already in ventricular fibrillation and, and they're going to die. De, uh, DeMar, it was interesting. He was actually, uh, he got struck in the chest. They think what happened to him is called commodia cordis. Uh, it's what happens sometimes if a baseball or a hockey puck um, or a cricket ball hits just in the wrong place at the wrong time in the chest and induces a life-threatening heart rhythm that if someone doesn't jump on it, uh, then they can die. And he's been cleared He's been cleared to play football again. Right. It turns out that it was. He just got struck exactly the wrong way at exactly the wrong time in the heart rhythm cycle that that happened. But otherwise, he has a perfectly healthy heart. It's, it's always been interesting to me how, you know, you watch that replay in slow motion. He stands up and for a moment, he seems fine. And this is how my father died. It was in between Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. He stood up, he says, I feel dizzy, and that was it. Yeah, I think, unfortunately for your dad and for Damar, um, they had gone into a dangerous heart rhythm and blood stops getting to the head. And when they stand up within seconds, there's no blood up there and they hit the ground. Oh yeah, they actually made the same movement. That was exactly the same yeah. movement. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. Well, so it, it's almost impossible in this hour to cover everything, but I wanted to move forward a little bit because um, when you talk about the, oh, you know, the other thing I want to talk about, was, uh, as, I, as I told you before we began, I wrote you some questions that I might be asking. One of them was um, about the epigraph. 
and we don't have to go through all of them, but the reason I find them fascinating, once again, as a bookseller, is because people like to read them. And I like them because the authors wouldn't put them in there unless they thought a long time about yeah. the, yeah. the chapter. How'd you come up with all those? They're all really good. Uh, a lot of research. Um, I would uh, write a chapter, um, you know, I'd write a chapter on, um, for instance, art. And then I went and I looked for quotes by artists and found if there were any relevant. Uh, I can actually give you, uh, Vincent Van Gogh said, I have put my heart and soul into my work and have lost my mind in the process. I thought that was especially relevant for the heart in art chapter. It's interesting, the people that you choose, and I have some of them here too, but um, <laughs> some of them are really funny. And it's, for example, oh yeah, we can talk about this. Um, Kurt Vonnegut, most things uh, in the world don't work, but aspirin does. Aspirin do. does, <laughs> that's right. But, but the other thing is like I said to you before, aspirin and caffeine are like those things that one day coffee is great for you or wine is great for you and the next day it's not. And yeah. dosage of that aspirin that you're supposed to be taking is the same dosage as St. Joseph's Children's aspirin because it was easy for the companies to do. Right. So what's the um, deal? Actually, the history of aspirin is, is also curious. Um, if you look at uh, Sumerian cuneiform tablets from 3500 BCE, they were using willow and myrtle, um, which both contain uh, salicylic acid, which is essentially what aspirin is made of. Um, for aches and pains over 5,000 years ago. And then willow bark was used by Greeks, Romans, Africans, Mesoamericans, Chinese uh, for as a pain and fever uh, reducer. And it was used right up through the Middle Ages. And it wasn't until the 1800s uh, that acetyl salicylic acid, or what we now know as aspirin, was made. Bear which was a uh, drug and dye company, started selling it in 1899 as a pain reliever. And one of their first ads says, it won't affect the heart. <laughs> 50 years later, we found out it affected the heart. It reduced heart attacks. Uh, there's been many studies looking at aspirin's beneficial effect on heart attacks. And so we got to the point where we were putting everybody on aspirin. But it turns out that the risk outweighs the benefit in some people. And we're learning that now. So current guidelines will say, if you have known coronary artery disease, absolutely should, you know, secondary prevention, you should be on aspirin for life. The question is in primary prevention. And we were telling people who had never had heart attacks or strokes that they should be taking aspirin. But the problem is those people have a small risk of having cardiovascular disease, but they also have a small risk of stomach bleeds, uh, brain bleeds, hemorrhagic strokes. So in going back and looking at the data, people who are at high risk, so they have greater than 10% chance of having a cardiovascular event over the next 10 years. Those are the people we consider putting on aspirin now. But if you don't meet that criteria, aspirin is not beneficial. And we do use 81, although most of the studies looked at 162 to 325, but it's convenient because we were already making baby aspirins and that's why we use baby aspirin. That's another thing my brother and I did, which was horrible, especially for kids and race syndrome. But St. Joseph's baby aspirin for children tasted so good. It we, did. I I've remember. Never, I've never tasted that flavor again. And my yeah. brother and I would just would eat it. It's amazing we're still alive. Plus playing with mercury from my uncle's a dentist. Well, fortunately, you had no brain malformation, so you're fine. Yeah. Well, who knows? <laughs> Some <laughs> others may disagree. Um, the other thing that's interesting is with the epigraphs is you pick people that I definitely admire for the most, yeah, all of them I admire. And you have two epigraphs from Steve Jobs, who was yeah. a, in addition to being a person who put a dent in the universe, he was also someone who had, how, how do I put it? He, he, he basically, that's another way of looking hard is, you know, follow, follow your dream kind of thing. And that's right. He said, follow, hey, sorry, follow your heart, what do you have to lose? What, is that, what does that even mean though? 
it means go, it, it, I guess another way to say it would be go with your gut. But if, if your heart tells you, if your feelings tell you wherever they are located, your head, your heart, your gut, go with them. You don't live forever. So go ahead and just do it. It's an interesting bifurcation though, because going with your gut is like saying, okay, here's a problem. I figured the solution out. I'm going to implement it. It's almost military. Whereas following your heart has that, as I said at the outset, that romantic connotation. Right. And I don't or, know that, that. or that goodness. Exactly. Yeah. So no wonder you find it fascinating. Yes. So what so what what was and what still is your day-to-day -day work with the heart? I'm still a full-time practicing cardiologist. Um, and which I love again, I get to take care of my patients. It's an honor to, to help them in their heart health. Um, when I wrote this book was essentially Saturdays and early mornings. I'd get up very early in the morning and work for a couple hours. That was the only way I could get it done. Did you have index cards all over the wall? Like people do. <laughs> um, I, I actually, because that's the way I worked with, with all my previous, uh, you know, journal articles and chapter chapters that I wrote, but no, I did this one on the computer. I wanted to be in the modern age. So I, I had my notes on all on the computer. You've given me some good segues because that goes right into, since you're using the computer, that goes into your chapter about the future of the heart. And yes. that was really fascinating because, you know, there was that, um, six weeks, six day old kid, Oliver, who had a heart transplant. And, you know, I can't even imagine how that was done. But at the same time, when you talk about the bakey and um, Christine yeah. and, and the beginnings, of, the beginnings of the artificial heart, obviously you, you are the person to tell me, where do you think that's going? Especially now when you talk about 3D print. Yeah, yeah, that's where it's going. And that it's just, it's mind boggling. I mean, look where we are now. We are, we're now at the point where we're putting in valves um, on a catheter instead of doing open heart surgery. I mean, that's the future now. Um, but you know, where where are we going? We at we're not like salamanders. When when heart cells die, we can't regenerate them. Salamanders can. But new um, stem cell research and genetic uh, therapies are helping us to regrow heart cells from, from stem cells in areas of the heart where there's now scar. So we can rebuild the heart by injecting cells. So that's actively being studied now. Um, xenotransplantation, that's transplantation of another animal's heart into a human. We've tried chimpanzees, baboons, pigs, dogs, goats. Um, I hate to say it, but the one most, the heart most like a human is a pig heart. I think George Orwell in the animal farm. Um, uh, and actually recently in the news, a recipient of a genetically modified pig heart um, survived two months with that heart. Um, we now have mechanical hearts or mechanical assist device that we're actively using. So we have what's called an LVAD, a left ventricular assist device. So if a person has a broken heart, we can implant this and assist their heart until time of transportation, transplantation or the heart recovers. And there's some people who aren't candidates for transplantation. Um, and we're now putting in completely artificial heart into those people as destination therapy. And I think the, the longest one has been seven years survival. Um, but 3D printing is going to be really interesting because we'll be able to design custom made heart valves to put in a person that matches their original one. And as you said, we may ultimately get to the point where we can 3D recreate a heart using that person's stem cells to make them another heart. Now that's obviously in the future, but that's the way we're heading. Yeah, and the thing is, the reason when I was reading the book was the same time that 
all this has come out about artificial intelligence and the snowballing and then people coming out and saying it's going to destroy civilization and you know using it as you probably have too you must be amazed i could ask it um what kind of questions should i ask a person who's written the book about the heart and i'll get really right. good by better than the ones i ask and so if that's moving as fast as it is why can't you say okay maybe you you could say something like if i asked you 10 years ago oh well maybe in 50 years it might work. would you now say 30 years would you now say 20 years and for many of the therapies i've described i would say definitely within 20 years a, a whole heart uh, I'll see it when I believe it, but the, the way that therapies have accelerated through the 20th and 21st century with regards to the heart. I mean, at the beginning of the 20th century, we finally knew what a heart attack was, but it was bed rest and a priest was the answer. You know, <laughs> by the end of the 20th century, you know, we're doing angioplasty, stents, bypass surgeries, um, heart transplants, valve replacements, pacemakers, defibrillators. So it's amazing what can happen in a short period of time. And it almost seems like it's accelerating. And so who knows what we'll see over the next 20 years. Biologic pacemakers, where they inject cells that replace the heart's pacemaker without having to put a tin can in them with, with leads. Um, using nanobots, little you know, cell-sized robots to break through a clot in a heart attack so that you can get the, the rescue medicines through quicker and save more muscle. I mean, gene therapy, personalized gene therapy, where we're creating vaccines to prevent people from having future heart attacks. There's a lot coming. And again, of course, it always, you always have to take into account where you are when it happens, whether you're here, whether you're in New York, whether you're in Boise, Idaho, or whether you're in Zam Zambia, you know? Right, right. Because, and, and it's, it's fascinating also that, uh, with this recent um, brain surgery in utero that they did. Um, oh, yeah. it, where was it? Is that here? I, I don't know, but fascinating that yeah, and, and they're able to do it. They, they, do, they do heart surgery on uh, fetuses still in the womb. It's, it's just, it's mind boggling. And yet less than a hundred years ago, we weren't doing heart surgeries. Oh, uh, I shouldn't be doing this as we're concluding. Cause I, I always go back to the beginning, but the beginning story, and, and maybe this is a good way to end, was the nobleman, the aristocrat who hit the jagged. Yeah, Hugh Montgomery. Yeah, talk about that. That was fascinating. To yeah, begin so with. Hugh Montgomery, um, son of a Viscount, uh, fell at age 10 off a horse and hit a, a sharp rock, which crushed his ribs and caused an abscess over the heart. Um, miraculously, I guess the abscess popped and he survived, but he ended up with essentially a hole in his chest and there was nothing between the heart and the outside except just a sort of a, a fibrous membrane. So you could actually look in that hole and see his heart beating. And he actually became famous and he traveled Europe um, so people could see this fascination. When he came back to London, William Harvey had heard about it and he was the the doctor or the physician of uh, King Charles II. King Charles II wanted to see this guy. So Hugh Montgomery was brought by William Harvey to the king and the king actually reached in and touched his beating heart. I wouldn't want a lot of people touching, <laughs> touching my But well, you let the king, you let the king. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I feel no pain because the heart has no... Right, and that was part of the demystification of the heart because William Harvey said, well, if." If it can't feel you touching it, then how can it hold emotion? What do you expect, really, in conclusion? What would you expect? Because I'm going to be out front, and this is going to be on the table at the bookstore. Um, already is, actually. Uh, so what do you expect people to take away from this book with regard to not only the anatomical structure of the heart, but the history of it in terms of uh, its, its feelings, the way people feel about it, and also, secondly, with regard to their own health and their own body. What are the things you want them to think about? I think what I love is when, when people come back and they, they express awe in the pervasiveness of, of the heart in art, culture, religion, 
uh, in society from ancient times to present. Um, I want them to, to understand why uh, the heart was considered so important for millennia to human beings and how maybe those humans weren't so wrong after all, that it turns out maybe the heart is playing more of a role in our, in our spiritual and our emotional and, and our physical lives uh, because it is constantly working with the brain to maintain our health. And that's funny, and that's what I took away from it. And it's not, I did not expect that in the slightest when I began the book. So that's what's fun about it. Well, so thank you so much. I, I mean, there's so much more we could have talked about, but I'm, I'm glad we got to jump around and, and talk about a lot of the book. So thank you so much, Vincent. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me on the program. Bye-bye.